Good morning, Cornerstone Church. So glad to see all of you. Glad you're here. If you're new with us, thanks for being here. Thanks for making it through the cold, the snow. Uh, it's great to see you. I am Scott Godinez. I am the youth pastor here. Our senior pastor, Anthony Prano, is currently in Arizona with his family, enjoying the warm weather, I'm sure. Uh, just taking some time off to get close and, and rest and get some relaxation. So I bet he's having a great time. I hope you all had a great week this week. I had an awesome week. Seven days ago, it was my birthday, and I turned 30 years old, which I was super excited about. I've actually always wanted to be 30. Um, it's a huge goal of mine. This is why. Ever since I heard about Jesus possibly being about 30 years old when he started his public ministry, I was like, well, shoot, all I got to be is 30, and me and him will be like almost the same guy. So I really thought everything in my life would just kind of come together and I'd just be, you know, sanctified and everything. Well, I'm about seven days in, and honestly, guys, I'm still struggling to share the TV remote with my wife. So keep, keep your prayers coming. I need them. But it's hard to share, right? It's, it's kind of tough, especially if you've got something really cool, something you, something you really like, something you love a lot. Uh, I have two daughters. One of them's four. The other one's about two and a half. And they are the worst at sharing. We have to get them two of everything. They simply just love their toys too much and just do not want to part with them or share with them or anything. Pretty sure they get it from their mom, but you know. <laughs> and so I think it's funny because, I mean, I bet we've gotten gifts like that before. Maybe you've received a, a brand new grill and no one can touch it. Or maybe you got one of those cool uh, mixer things, you know, the ones with the sit down and the thing spins and holds the bucket, that fancy Cuisinart deal. Maybe you got something just absolutely incredible. You had it framed, you put it in a safe, maybe you wanted to keep it safe. You know, it's something you treasure, it's, it's, it's valuable to you. I still remember when I got to see one of America's greatest treasures. I was a senior in high school, and my older brother, I went to go visit him. He lived in Washington, D.C. It was my first trip to our nation's capital. And I was super excited to go to all the museums and get to see all the cool stuff they had. And so we got to, one day we went to the National Archives. And it's just insane levels of security. We had to fill out all this stuff online just to even get an appointment to go. And then we get there, and it's, you know, like metal detectors, scanners, the whole deal. When I finally get to where I want to go, I'm greeted by this dimly lit room uh, with two armed guards standing adjacent to inches of bulletproof glass and, and who knows how many other security measures protecting the thing I came to see, the Declaration of Independence. And it was, it was such an experience, y'all. I, mean, I know it's a piece of paper, but, but coming face to face with this, this document that symbolized something that so many men and women were willing to die for, it was just truly a treasure. And... It wasn't just that. I got to see the flag, too. Like, not just any flag, but the flag, the, the star-spangled banner, the big 30-foot by 40-foot massive flag that hung over Fort McHenry. It was the same flag that inspired Francis Scott Key, watching from afar, to write what would become our national anthem. It was, it was absolutely awesome, and it was just incredible to be right there before me, to see this flag that men literally died protecting. And just made me wonder, what led these men who were severely outmatched, outgunned, to continue to fight? And the, the, the barrage of artillery from the, the British Navy lasted for 25 hours, thousands of cannonballs and shrapnel exploding above their heads, and they still raised our flag up. What were they fighting for? Our freedom? Their families? They were fighting for a treasure that meant more to them than their own lives. And isn't that incredible? You know, I'm sure we can all think of similar stories that have impacted us like that. Uh, you think about one of the highest grossing movies of all time, Avengers, right? Um, largely based on a group of heroes who are self-sacrificing and are coming together and risking their lives for a treasured purpose. Now, some people may call it a cause or just a response to evil. But the reality is when we treasure something, I mean like really treasure something, we're willing to go great lengths to protect it, to fight for it, and to sacrifice for it. What is the greatest treasure of your life? Or here's an easier question. What ought to be the greatest treasure of your life? You know, the Bible makes it clear. Jesus must be the treasure, the greatest treasure of our lives. He's our Lord, our shepherd. 
And if you've been listening to Christmas music, then you can, a, couple, a couple other names might come to mind. Emmanuel, Mighty Counselor, Prince of Peace. And every one of these names ascribes the, the weight of his value and importance in our lives. We must treasure him. Jesus must be your greatest treasure. But when we live in a country so filled with shiny things and opulence, it's easy to forget Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that we don't love God or, or we don't pray to Jesus or we don't worship on Sunday. I'm saying that with so much material wealth surrounding us, we can be distracted. We begin to look at luxuries as needs. And we invest our lives in this place as if heaven wasn't waiting for us in eternity. So what must we do then to make Jesus our greatest treasure? Let's look at a story about a man who I really think shows us. But before we get in, I just want to share a few words because we're, we're just kind of hopping into it out of nowhere. Uh, we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke, and I love the Gospel of Luke. One of my favorite things is how much Luke emphasizes the salvation of people who are often socially outcast or, um, or fringe or, or even detestable. And it, it, it connects to me so much because growing up as a kid, I often felt like I was kind of weird. And uh, I was never really sure if anyone would truly accept me. Yet here is Luke uh, drawing our attention to the exact same kinds of people and showing them how Jesus sought after them and brought them into a relationship, into salvation. And it's just so encouraging to me. So we're going to look at Zacchaeus. And he's actually the only chief tax collector ever mentioned in the entire Bible. He was really rich. He was powerful. And he was a despised man that no God-fearing Jew would dare be seen with. You see, he was also a Jewish man. And he manipulated, lied, and extorted money from other Jews for personal gain. And Jesus, Jesus was going to have dinner with him. So let's take a look at our passage this morning. So if you've got your Bible or your phone, uh, or you're going to read behind me, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. We're going to do verses 1 through 10. So Luke 19, and we're going to start verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone, gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. It's a great story, right? It's one of my favorites. It's funny. It's got some kind of action. And then it ends great. Like, the dude gets saved. It's, it's a perfect story. I love happy endings. It is so great. So let's, let's hop in. Our first point this morning. Treasure Jesus more than status. We must treasure Jesus more than status. You see, although Zacchaeus was a widely disliked man, it would be hard to say that he was not widely known. A man of his wealth and reputation was surely known to all of Jericho. He would have certainly been a public figure with substantial dignity. Yet here in these verses, we see a man acting much more like a child. Notice that Zacchaeus in the text, when realizing he would be unable to see Jesus, decided that his next best option was to run ahead and climb a tree. Like, like why not just push through the crowd or yell, say, get out of the way? I don't want you to miss that fact. This had to have been a humorous scene. So behind me we'll have a slide of something he was likely wearing. We got Zacchaeus in these robes, you know, maybe he's got some sandals on. And uh, I mean, it's obvious this guy wasn't exactly shopping in REI. But he knew, he knew he could not miss out on this opportunity. So this rich old man hikes up his robes and just sprints toward a sycamore tree, climbs up it, 
And you don't even have to imagine the scene. It looks kind of ridiculous. I feel kind of ridiculous. <laughs> but if you know me well enough, you know that I look ridiculous half the time anyway. But Zacchaeus may not have been widely respected. He would have at least been widely feared. And to be seen up in a tree like, <laughs> like this would destroy his reputation. Why would a man like Zacchaeus go through such lengths to see this, this Jesus? And remember, Jesus was just a prophet, just another guy back then. We, we know the whole story, but back then he was just another dude coming through town. You see, at some point, Zacchaeus must have thought to himself, this Jesus is no ordinary man. And so he sets aside his pride, his comfort, and his status for the greater treasure of seeing Jesus. Surely, there were people mocking his efforts, teasing him for drawing attention to his own height deficiency, which some of us guys can be kind of sensitive about. People already hated the man. His willingness to climb a tree for everyone to see definitely put him on a silver platter of ridicule. But you see, when Jesus is your greatest treasure, surrendering your status and your pride is the only response. It may cause you to be teased, ridiculed, misunderstood, and more. So why would anyone do this? Why would anyone endure this? Because Jesus is worth more to you than your reputation. Friends, do not be surprised when John tells us, if you were of the world, it would love you as its own. Instead, the world hates you because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. John 15, 19. Again, James continues this thought in other words. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. A fallen, sin-saturated world will never support the sacrifices you make for Jesus. This is a hard saying. And I wonder if anyone has ever has ever felt this before? Has anyone ever chosen Jesus over a friendship? Has anyone ever chosen Jesus over unrighteousness? It tends to upset people. For what fellowship does light have with darkness? Treasuring Jesus above everything will affect how people think of you. But so long as Jesus is just what you do on Sundays, when he's confined to an accessory of your life, no one is concerned. But the moment you begin to make him part of your everyday life, the moment Jesus becomes your greatest treasure is when the world pushes back. Consider King David's reaction. When the Ark of the Covenant, the same Ark carrying the Ten Commandments, entered into Jerusalem, his reaction was entirely unbecoming of a king. And his wife watched him in shame. As the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Michael is entirely disappointed in David for his exuberant adoration, his wanton worship. She accuses him of acting like a lower-class citizen, being uncovered, meaning he wasn't wearing his full kingly robes and all the, the royal attire. But David's response is dripping with evidence of what he treasured more than his status as king. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more indignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. Or consider the story of Eric Liddell, the Olympic sprinter for Great Britain, who forfeited his spot in the 100 meter and the two 400 meter relay races. He was ridiculed and derided for months in the press leading up to the 1924 Summer Olympics in Paris. No one could understand why he would drop out of his two best races where he was most likely to win the gold medal. Great Britain even appealed to the Olympic Committee saying, please reschedule the event. Do it on a different day, please. Now, if you know Eric's story, you know the reason why he didn't run. The events were scheduled on a Sunday, and Eric Liddell refused to race on the, the convictions of his faith 
prevented him from the glory of gold medals, the apex of so many athletes, the pinnacle of accomplishment. Glory. Instead, he broke a world record in the 400 meter individual run and won gold. The race is on Friday. What might this look like for you? Is Jesus your greatest treasure? There's nothing more worthy of your love and adoration than Jesus. And there's great blessing to be found in lowering yourself before God. Check out these verses. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. For all those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. This is great news. In a social media-filled world, so many people are competing for the fame and the prestige and the renown of others. The follower of Jesus does not have to be stressed about getting more likes than the next person. We can surrender our reputation to Jesus and treasure him more than our worldly status. There's no reason to try to keep up with the Joneses when our greater treasure will always be Jesus. But that can sometimes be easier said than done, right? Like, why get an iPhone with 128 gigs of memory if you could get one with 256 gigabytes of memory, right? There's a pressure to always have the best that we can afford, sometimes even more than we can afford. The buying ethic in our country is focused on acquiring as, as much as possible. I mean, anyone ever get one of those, uh, those buy one, get one free deals and not taking the free thing? I always take the free thing. Like, I love it. I, I got to do it. And I know there's got to be at least one person in here that will go buy it just to get the free thing. We love a good deal. We're going to go broke saving so much money. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. There's a certain comfort in plenty. But when Jesus is the greater treasure, we find ourselves not as impressed with all the material possessions of the world. And this is why we're called to treasure Jesus more than possessions. We must treasure Jesus more than our possessions. So some time has passed between the moment when Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down, and, and now they're kind of hanging out, they're having a conversation, they're, they're back at Zacchaeus' house, and this is when this all goes down. And already we know that most of the tax collectors were extortionists who raised the price of taxes so they could skim a little extra off the top for themselves. So here we see Zacchaeus going way beyond the norm in regard to his possessions. He commits to giving away half of everything he owns. That's not, not, not just like what's in his wallet. That's everything he owns. That's like, there goes one of my shoe. That's half of everything you own. Something like that. Half of everything he owns and gives it to the poor. And then he goes beyond that as well when he declares to refund everyone what he stole from them. And this refund is far more than what was legally required. Instead of just a 20% a increase added to the full refund as per Old Testament law, Zacchaeus has decided to go four times as much in line with what might be considered the harshest of penalties for this, this particular kind of infraction. So what we have here is Jericho, or we have Zacchaeus, they're one of the richest men in all Jericho, dining with Jesus, sacrificing all, or sacrificing half of all he owns to give to the poor, and then with the remaining 50% of his wealth, he's declared to pay back everyone full refund plus an additional 400%. Obviously, Zacchaeus had come into possession of a greater treasure than all his possessions and wealth. It's Jesus. And I don't think we can overstate the massive hit to Zacchaeus' lifestyle here. I mean, he had to have been driving the nicest camel on the block, and now he's got to trade that in for last year's donkey. See, we have so many longings in our lives that this world tries to fill, but it never will. And I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. You know, ever since I could hold a quarter in my hand, I've tried to buy cool stuff that promised to satisfy me. From gumballs to new houses, the past 30 years of my life have made it clear that there is nothing on this planet that will ever satisfy me the way Jesus can. 
Jesus is worth more than I could ever own because he gives me what I could never buy. In chapter 21, Luke describes a scene at the temple treasury. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow who put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Again, in Matthew, Jesus shares two similar parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went, sold all he had, and bought the whole field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. In all of these examples, it is clear that the person treasures something far greater than their possessions. The widow gives all that she has. The man buys an entire field. The merchant sells everything to buy this one pearl of great value. Contrast this with the rich young ruler who walked away from Jesus disappointed. Jesus had commanded him to give up all of of his possessions. But the young man was unwilling. You see, his mistake was overestimating the worth of what he already had and underestimating the worth of what he could have with Jesus. When we understand how much more value we gain by having more of Jesus than by having more of our possessions, we are freed from the bondage of materialism. We're not slaves to clever advertising and opulence. I love this quote from Corey Ten Boom. You can never learn that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. But how exactly do we treasure Jesus more than our possessions? My suggestion is we learn to enjoy him more. Seek him in his word. Read your Bible daily. Confess your sin to him. Invite discipleship and accountability into your life and experience the impact of his transformative power. I can assure you, no matter how impressive that 8K or 4K TV is, it'll never soften your heart to become a better listener, to delight in your spouse, or to guide your children in wisdom and truth. You know, I've heard people doubt the value of Jesus, and why wouldn't they? Do our possessions reflect our value in Jesus or in things? Do we sacrifice buying certain things in order to invest in ministries that grow the kingdom of God? Do we use our resources to reach the three billion people who've never even heard the name of Jesus and the millions more, our brothers and sisters in faith, who are suffering from famine and disease? Are we more invested in scoring a deal on a new flat screen than ministering to these people? It's an easy trap to fall into. We grow up in the United States and are told to believe that we can have anything we want and we deserve it if we work hard enough. I sometimes wonder if the American dream might also be a Christian nightmare. It's way too self-centered. My happiness, my accomplishment, my possessions. Our lives must show that we value Jesus more than our possessions. Our lives must show That true satisfaction and enjoyment is not found in a house, a car, a spouse, 2.5 kids, and a dog. The height of our satisfaction will come from the depth of our love for Jesus. So what happens? What happens when we treasure Jesus more than our status? When we treasure Jesus more than our possessions? In verses 9 and 10, we see that Zacchaeus experienced a whole new relationship with Jesus. It brought him a whole new life, a whole new way of living and looking at the world. And for us this morning, I want to challenge you with something special. Treasure Jesus more than what other people think of you. More than all your awesome stuff. And together, take the next step to find that we can treasure Jesus more than life itself. We must treasure Jesus more than life. There's a story I read about a man named John Robert Fox. 
He was a 29-year-old African-American husband and father fighting for the United States during World War II. Almost exactly 75 years ago to the day, he died. His wife widowed, his daughter fatherless. In Italy, he was fighting in a small town defending it against Nazi invaders. On Christmas Day, it was just a nice, fun, happy day. Soldiers were strolling through the city, enjoying the festivities. But by that night, more and more German soldiers began infiltrating the city. By the morning of December 6th, it was clear to the Allied forces they would need to have a full retreat. They were being overrun by these Nazi soldiers. Many retreated. Fox did not. Instead, he continued to do his job. He went and hid out inside the second floor of a house, continuing to radio in positions of the enemy moving around. He called for artillery fire, increasingly close to his own position. He told his battalion commander, that was just where I wanted. Now bring it in 60 more yards. His commander protested that there was a heavy barrage in the area and that the bombardment would be too close. Lieutenant Fox gave his adjustment, requesting that the barrage be fired. The distance was cut in half. The Germans continued to press forward in large numbers surrounding his position. Lieutenant Fox again called for artillery fire with the commander protesting again, stating, Fox, that's going to be on you. The last communication from Lieutenant Fox was, fire it. There's more of them than there are of us. Give them hell. Fox's body was found in the rubble amongst 100 dead German soldiers. At the cost of his own life, he inflicted heavy casualties, thereby delaying the advance of the, of the, uh, the enemy until the army could regroup and, and, re, and re, realign. John Robert Fox was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. It was not just John Fox. Many men and women fought with valor and great sacrifice. What could these men and women have fought for that they were willing to, to die? What is it that they treasured more than their own lives? Family, freedom, our country? I think for each soldier, it's unique to them. But the truth is, they indeed treasured something greater than their own life. Can you imagine what that kind of attitude would do to the church? I'm not sure if you've noticed the theme in a bunch of my illustrations this morning. They have to do, they're somehow related to war. And there's a reason for that. See, I believe we must treasure Jesus more than life. And to do this, we must wake up and adopt a wartime lifestyle. I love this phrase because it forces us to recognize that there is a very real war happening as we speak. A war between Jesus and Satan. A war between truth and falsehood, belief and unbelief. And there is a war effort that must be funded. Weapons supplied to ensure victory. These weapons are not guns or bombs, but prayer, self-sacrificing love, and the gospel. I need this reminder more than I care to admit. How easily we slip into a peacetime mindset thinking that we can use our money and resources in the same way the unbelievers do. In the luxury of my life, I can forget the need for global missions. I can forget unreached peoples. How easily we fall in love with earth, thinking that this is our home. What if Christians operated like Americans during World War II? Our entire country unified around a single mind, victory over evil, no matter the cost. See, people rationed their food, they rationed their gas, they rationed everything they could to send resources toward the front lines. People bought war bonds, they planted victory gardens, conserved as much as they could, and inconvenienced themselves as much as possible with the attitude of supporting the war effort. The slogan, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without, became an anthem for Americans during the war effort. When's the last time you heard an advertisement tell you to do without? Throughout history, there's countless stories of sacrifice and selflessness. Oh, church, how I love these stories, but, and, and they're incredible causes, but these, the things that these men and women fought for, but there's one greater cause still. I love this quote from John Piper. The greatest cause in the world is joyfully rescuing people from hell. 
meeting their earthly needs, making them glad in God, and doing it with a kind, serious pleasure that makes Christ look like the treasure he is. What could happen when the people of Cornerstone Church adopt a wartime lifestyle? What happens when the mission of the gospel galvanizes us to a central single purpose? Could you ration your time so you're able to volunteer in the kids' ministry? Could you order a tall coffee instead of a grande and help fund our mission trip to Juarez next summer? Could you pray like the lives of your loved ones depend on it? Could you learn new skills, cut back on luxuries, and contribute more directly to the missional cause of Jesus? What resources do you have at your disposal already? Will we turn off the TV, pray together, and dream? Dream about what incredible things God might be calling us to do. Yes, it might seem hazardous. Yes, the way may be uncertain. And yes, it'll be worth it. I love this, this passage, this verse right here out of Mark. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. It's such an incredible promise. It's something that I have to, God has reminded me of several times with the sacrifices he's called me and my family to make. But I, I wonder if you noticed that last part. It almost sounded out of place along with persecutions. But I love that Jesus puts that in there. Even the hardships and adversity that will come in following Jesus are not his abandonment or his punishment. They are simply part of treasuring Jesus more than life. And may we never lose sight of what's to come while we endure. Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Friends, there is a war going on, and the world must see how much more valuable Jesus is than our status, how much more valuable Jesus is than our possessions, how much more we treasure Jesus than our own life. I do not want to pretend that what I've shared with you this morning is not without struggle. I know it probably seems to many of us that we're already doing everything we can, and to others it may seem too extreme. I want to share one more thing with you this morning. I wonder if you caught the parallel. I've tried to show you through Zacchaeus' example that Jesus must be your greatest treasure. But why? What makes Jesus worthy of all this sacrifice and all this faith? See, unlike Zacchaeus, you didn't have to climb up a tree and risk ridicule and mockery. Jesus took your spot on a tree, a cross to be exact, and faced greater humiliation and mockery than anyone else. Unlike Zacchaeus, you did not have to volunteer to pay back all of your debts or face penalty. Jesus paid your debt to God. In one supreme payment, to tell us die, he cried in one breath, payment in full. He paid the highest penalty of sin and died for you. Unlike Zacchaeus, you didn't have to go looking for Jesus. He's been looking for you all your life. Jesus loves you so radically that he's already done everything he's asking you to do and more. He loved you first, and he will never stop loving you. Jesus, the king of kings, gave up every ounce of status he had in this world, despised and rejected by those he came to save. Jesus fell in love with no possession, for not even the Son of Man has a place to lay his head. And in life, he took on the appearance of man, humbled himself, and was obedient to death, even death on a cross. He gave his life for you. Make Jesus your greatest treasure, more than status, possessions, even more than your life. Treasure Jesus above all else, 
and you will know a completed satisfaction unlike anything this world can offer. And join the war effort. We could really use someone like you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for revealing yourself to us, for sending Jesus to do everything that we could not do, to take our place on the cross, to pour out his love for us, to show us what it means to truly treasure something. God, we, we want to surrender ourselves to you. We want to repent and turn away from the love of possessions, the love of status. Your word tells that he who tries to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will gain it. Lord, let us take hold of this promise and press upon our hearts a desire to give everything to you, to know that you and you alone are holy, are great, are beautiful in all majesty. Your love, infinite. Your grace, eternal. God, Jesus, you're more than just our captain. You're our savior. Thank you for your truth, your word, and help us to make you our greatest treasure. Use us, God, to go out, to join the war effort, to be people of God on mission for you. God, we don't have to wonder what could happen. We've seen what you can do with just a few men giving themselves completely up to you. They changed the world, and we're still talking about it 2,000 years later. God, use Cornerstone Church. Please use us. Help us to glorify you by how much we're satisfied in you. God, you are so good. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name, the name above all names, we pray. Amen.